look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Father, for this day that thou hast given us, yet another day. Lord, yet another Wednesday, O Lord, that you gave us the privilege to be found in your sanctuary, O Lord, this evening. All of us, your children, O Lord, we are gathered in your presence, O Lord. Father, we have come here, O Lord, so that we can listen to your voice and to hear your voice, O Lord, the still small voice of the Spirit of the living God, speaking to each one of us this evening, O Lord. Father, I am merely a vessel. Father, with all my frailties, with all my inconsistencies, O Lord, I submit myself to you, O Lord. I pray, O Lord, Father, that you would speak through me, speak to me and to all of us over here, O Lord. That, Lord, that we will listen to you and not to me, O Lord, Father. Thank you, Father, for this time, O Lord. Quicken the Spirit, quicken this word, I pray, O Lord. Father, unless your Spirit would quicken this word, O Lord, Father, all the words will just fall flat to the ground. They will have no effect, O Lord, Father. Unless your, your Spirit quickens your word, O Lord, Father. I pray, Lord, Father, that nothing, it will not have any effect. I pray, Lord, Father, that you would speak to us, quicken our hearts, quicken our minds. So that, Lord, we can hear you, O Lord, and we would, Lord Father, obey whatever is shared, Lord Father, this evening. Thank you, Father. We praise you, we worship you, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good evening, saints. Uh, just want to share a few thoughts today. If you've been coming to this church for... Quite some time now, most of you have been here, you've been coming to, coming to this church, you've been very regular on Sundays as well as on Wednesdays. See that most of the messages, I mean the, the, the primary calling I believe that this church and particularly this pulpit has, is that it's calling all of God's people back to repentance. If you've been listening to Pastor James's voice uh, messages, the vision has been that God's people have to come back to repentance. God's people have to come back to that relationship with Him. That was that is the primary uh, mission and focus, if you will, of this particular church. And and if you've been listening to a lot of messages, this one thing that has been coming time and time again is that. These are the last days and there is a set of believers who will be empowered with the spirit of Elijah, preaching the word with boldness and calling God's people back to repentance. That's been the primary focus of this church. And when I was meditating upon this, there was one verse that was coming to me, one one thought that always was coming to me. Is it possible that in the midst of all this teaching and preaching, is it possible that we might lose focus and we might miss the ministry of Elijah, the call of Elijah? Is it possible that we as believers can reject the message of Elijah? Is it possible? And even as I was meditating upon this thought, just one thought that I had was, that came to my mind was, is it possible that we as a church miss the calling or the, 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 the primary focus of this entire mission of this church to miss that voice, to reject the voice of Elijah? And if you, if you just turn to me uh, just before I start, I just want to share, uh, look at one verse in Malachi chapter 4, if you will. The last book of the Bible before, uh, of, the, of the New Testament of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The last word of the, of the Old Covenant ends with the word curse. Why does it say that? It's possible 
that if you don't listen to this spirit of Elijah which is going to raise up in the last days, God will smite all those who reject that message with a curse. It's a very solemn warning. And if, you, and if you've been coming to this church, one message that was coming, Pastor was saying, I am merely a voice in the wilderness. But that is the spirit of Elijah. And if you see, when Jesus came for the first time, the first coming of Jesus, before he started his ministry, there was one man. That is where we'll start. Turn with me to John chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19 onwards. One man. It says, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent the priests. Who sent? The Jews. Note that. Note this passage carefully, okay? Even as I'm reading it, just register. The whole message will revolve around this. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John the Baptist, they are asking John the Baptist, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny. He confessed, but he did not deny. But what did he confess? He confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then are you? Elijah? He said, What did he say? I am not. Look at that word. I am not. He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? Are you? And he answered, no. Then they said, said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? Mark that verse. Sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Note the point. He said, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. Okay, and what, what, when, when they came to John and asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah. But let's turn to another passage. Let's turn to... Matthew chapter 16. So just a minute, please. Oh. Oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 16, that's right. Matthew chapter 16, I'll give you the verse. Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry. This is uh, just a minute, please. I just. Um, first time. I'm first time preaching only from the New Testament. This is what happens. <laughs> uh, not that I'm not good with the New Testament. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that I'm good. Okay, Mark chapter 9, please. Mark chapter 9. <laughs> uh, if you would believe me, uh, believe me, this time it's only New Testament. I've been said, don't preach from the Old Covenant. Come on, start preaching from the New Testament. <sighs> okay. Mark chapter, Mark chapter 9, verse 13, verse 12. Okay, verse, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 10 onwards. Mark, Mark chapter 9, 10 onwards. This is Jesus who's talking about. So they kept the word to themselves, questioning what the rising of the dead meant, and 11th verse. And they asked him, why do the Pharisees say that Elijah must come first? No, the Pharisees had this inherent knowledge. They knew the scriptures very well. The new Malachi chapter, chapter, last chapter of Malachi. Elijah has to come first. So then when they came to John the Baptist, they were asking him, are you Elijah? And he said, no, I'm not Elijah. But what did Jesus say? And they asked him saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah has to come first? Then look at what Jesus says. Then he answered and told them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did him whatever they wished as it is written of him. And when he came to the disciples, you know what he's, who, who he is talking about? Who is he talking about? He's talking about John the Baptist. 
Now this is Jesus himself is saying that Elijah has already come. But when, when John, when the scribes and the Pharisees asked John, are you Elijah? And he said, no, 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 I'm not Elijah. I'm just a voice. But Jesus says, that was Elijah. Uh, this looks like a paradox. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of an oxymoron. How come Jesus said that John was, came with the spirit of Elijah? And John himself says, no, I'm not that Elijah. I'll tell you why it is. If you want to understand this completely, you should understand the characteristics of the Elijah ministry. What are the characteristics of the Elijah ministry? The first characteristics of Elijah ministry is in, recorded in J- James. Elijah was a man just like us. First characteristic. What is he? Elijah was a man of like passions. A man who was ordinary. James chapter 5, the last, last few verses. It says, Elijah was a man. So when, so you should understand. Elijah, this is John the Baptist who said, I am not Elijah. But Jesus said, John is, has come in the spirit of Elijah. So it is very important for us to understand what is the characteristics of this Elijah ministry. Elijah was a man just like us. So, in the new covenant, when Elijah came into the scene, nothing is told about where he is coming from. Suddenly he is in the scene. Elijah the Tishbite. He they ne- never mentioned who is his father, who is his mother. Nothing about Elijah is men- mentioned. Nothing. So what is the first characteristic of Elijah's ministry? A man who is just like us, who has no reputation, Okay, who has no reputation, uh, but, man, but a man who is only interested in bringing God's people back to repentance. That was his aim. No other agenda. A man who did not have any personal agenda. So when the Pharisees came and asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah. I'm just an ordinary man. Don't call me Elijah. Because of the essence of Elijah ministry is this. When they come and ask you, who are you? Are you Elijah? They say, no, 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 no. I'm not Elijah. I'm a voice leading to Jesus. The first characteristic of Elijah ministry is bringing God's people back to repentance. Always bringing God's people back to repentance. That's what John the Baptist said. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. That is the first First and the foremost agenda of Elijah ministry. Second, the characteristic of Elijah ministry number two is uncompromising with himself and uncompromising with his, with his word. When he's preaching the word, he lives what he preaches. He has no personal agenda. He's absolutely sold out to God. Uncompromising in his lifestyle and uncompromising in the way he preaches his word. That's exactly what happened when Elijah came. He said, Ahab, Ahab, call all those three fellows. If if Jehovah is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. How long will you halt between these two opinions? No personal agenda. And when he finishes, he says, Lord, I have done everything as you have commanded me to do. Okay, second characteristic. Uncompromising with his word and uncompromising with his Lifestyle and his, and his preaching. And Elijah is a man who is not interested in the opinions of men. So when the Pharisees come and ask him, are you Elijah? Please, I am just a voice in the wilderness. His glory or his recognition is from the Lord. Therefore Jesus says, that man is Elijah. His recognition is from the Lord. So you should understand when, when we come here and when we are preaching that this is Elijah ministry, the, in all things, Jesus has preeminence. Okay? So, but you should understand, it's very, it's quite possible that we might be in the midst of a church which is preaching the Elijah word, the Elijah gospel, and miss the whole purpose. This is a man who is not interested. They said, who are you? I'm not Elijah. I'm just a voice. Not interested in the opinions of men. And then, there are the people 
who are interested in making disciples of Jesus and not their own disciples. So when John comes, when people come to John and say, remember, you know Jesus? So many people are following him. What happened to you? He said, I must decrease and he has to increase. People have to follow Jesus. I am just merely a voice. I have no personal agenda. My purpose was to only lead people to Christ and make disciples of Jesus. And once they follow Jesus, please keep following. I will encourage you. That is my motive. They are not interested in making disciples of themselves. Elijah ministry, another characteristic of Elijah ministry, they are only interested in making disciples of Jesus. I am telling you, today there are very, very, very few churches all around the world who are interested in making disciples. Why do they give baptism? Baptism is not a baptism service, it is a membership service. You have members in the church of Jesus Christ who are not disciples, who are not repented of their sins. That is another characteristic of the Elijah ministry. So, the thing, the other thing. Another, another characteristic of Elijah's ministry, they are content with the God-given position in the body of Christ. That's beautiful. He says, what John says, a man cannot receive anything more than what he what God has given him. He cannot receive anything more than, I am not looking at Jesus, I am not looking at others here, there. I am just looking at my ministry and I want to do my, my ministry with, with faithfulness. That is what I am interested in. John chapter 3 verse 26 to 29, please. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So, what is the position given to John the Baptist? Position was a God-given position. Where? In the body of Christ. And he is only interested in to finish that God-given position. He is absolutely content. No hidden agenda. That is another characteristic of the Elijah ministry. So this is all about Elijah ministry. And then we can, I can just keep talking on and on. But I want to look at the dangerous side. When Jesus came first, prior to the coming of Jesus, John the Baptist came with the spirit of Elijah. And there were two classes of people who rejected the Elijah ministry. First, they were the, who? The Pharisees. The Pharisees, the religious class, they hate the Elijah ministry. They don't dislike the Elijah ministry. One of the characteristics of a Pharisee, he's always evaluating what the person is saying. Always evaluating, judging the person, not, not the spirit behind the person. He's always judging what he's saying. So then they come and they are always judging, who are you? Why are you saying this? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? What, which, which theological college did you come from? Are you from Fuller? What is your qualification? They are always interested in the person and they are evaluating the person then, then evaluating the message. That is the characteristic of a Pharisee. And those are the people who will reject the Elijah ministry. And you have to be very careful whether we are falling into that trap or not. And I'm going to prove to you by the end of the message that it is quite possible all of us can reject the Elijah ministry. So in order to do that, there's something Jesus says. Very careful. He says, be careful of one thing. Let's turn to Mark, Matthew chapter, gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 16, verse 6 onwards. Okay, okay, please go. Okay, please. Uh, just go a couple of verses before. For a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after the Pharisees come and asking, you know, when Jesus is preaching, the exact characteristic of a Pharisee. What do they do? They evaluate the person. Oh, if you are really the Jesus, please show us a sign. Then what does Jesus say? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah and he left them and departed and then go on. 
And now when his disciples had come together on the other side, they had forgotten to take bread and Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay. And he says, be very careful of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Be very careful. Be very careful. So what is the doctrine of the Pharisees? The doctrine of the Pharisees is this. Go back to John chapter 1 verse 24. Now those who sent them were the Pharisees. But these are the people who, as I told you right away, right now, they're always evaluating the person. Second, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denies power. So he says, Timothy says, in the last days there will be a lot of people who are adulterers, boasters, blasphemers, etc, etc, etc. And they, and when he ends it, he says, all these people have a form of godliness, but they don't have power within that means what? They have an outward lifestyle. They are religious people. They have substituted the relationship with God with religion. Religious minded people. That is one of the doctrines. Like let's, let's also turn to Luke chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is a doctrine of Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. They are hypocrites. And Jesus has some very strong words to say to these Pharisees. One of the doctrine of the doctrine of the Pharisees, they're full of hypocrisy. They're always interested in outward signs. How do we show that we are very religious? Second, only interested in men's opinion, not, not God's opinion. He's, they're only interested in the opinion of God, or opinion of men, never interested in opinions of God. Second, it's a doctrine of knowledge. How should we gain more knowledge? Attend Bible study after Bible study, attend every fasting prayer, attend every service, attend everything. Why? They want to increase in knowledge. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 5, chapter, chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. Always learning. Always learning. You see that, man, they're diligent people. They'll come to every Bible study. They will take notes. They're always learning, but they never come to the knowledge of truth. There's no life. There's very little obedience in their life. There's no life. Very interested in knowledge. God says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Always interested in knowledge. So we, let, let us ask ourselves, when we come to every Bible study, week after week, week after week, are, are we coming for knowledge? Are we coming for the knowledge of truth? So that we can deal with sin in our lives. Doctrine of knowledge. Then, doctrine of gain. They are not interested in the flock. They are not interested to feed the feed the flock of flock of Jesus Christ. They are interested to fleece the flock. Turn with me to Matthew chapter twenty three. Man, Jesus has strong words, woes to the Pharisees. Matthew chapter twenty three, verse twenty four. To you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and, and anise and cumin and neglect to the weightier matters of the Lord, justice and mercy and faith. Okay, knowledge, but no, but no true obedience. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a, out, out a gnat and swallow a camel. Then, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self indulgence. What do they do? Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them also will be clean. Then. Vote you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outward, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Outward appearance. More interested with outward appearance. How do I please? How do I make myself? And you know what? They appear very religious. That's the problem. And they are also very mission conscious. They're very mission conscious. Let me tell you how they are mission conscious. Turn with me to, again, Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 23, 
Just go on. Where is the proselyte thing? I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's, I think 16, verse 16, I guess. Verse 14, verse, verse 14 onwards. Verse 14. Yeah. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you devour widow's house for a, for a pretense, make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Next. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you travel land and sea to make one proselyte. Very mission conscious, brother. Oh. They will, they will support ministry after ministry. They will give to missions after missions. And why? When he is one, you make him twice the son of the devil than you are. What is the doctrine of Pharisees here? They are mission conscious, but it is a doctrine of bondage. It's a doctrine of bondage. You come to me, I counsel you, but... After I counsel you, you keep following me. But at the end of the counsel, that man is backslidden and it is gone into perdition. It's about doctrine of bondage. That is, and you have to judge ourselves in this church. All of us, all of us need to. Why do we run after after missions? Why do we run after men? Do you want to make them make them disciples of Vijay? People should always call me. I'm having this problem. Wherever they are, they should call me. I'm having this problem. I'm having this problem. Please pray for me. And you know what? They love it. They love it. That's a doctrine of bondage. That's a doctrine of bondage. At the end of it, that person has become two times the son of the devil. Then you are. It's a doctrine of bondage. Very, very careful. That's the reason why Jesus says, be very, very careful of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees. Which is hypocrisy. It's a doctrine of outward appearance. It's a doctrine of fleecing the flock. They're not interested to feed the, feed the flock. They're interested only to get money. They'll, even they'll go to a widow and extract money from her. They're not like Elijah. When Elijah went and asked for the widow to give him the offering, because in that offering there was deliverance. He was sent by God. He was not sent by a Pharisee. That is the difference. And if you are not sent by God, you are sent by a Pharisee and Jesus says, you are of your father the devil and of his works you will do. You are of the father, that means you are sent by the devil. So when you are going and fleecing the widow and saying you give all your money, then God will bless you. But the poor widow may be having a last thing, she will give that. At the end of it, she's broke. No deliverance in her life. Fleecing the flock. And don't tell me, that is the spirit of the last days. That is the spirit of Pharisee. Fleecing the flock. Third, the next doctrine is the doctrine of bondage. Be very careful. Be very careful. Any person in this church, including me, if I'm always making you be dependent upon me, then, this is the doctrine of bondage. There's not, not a doctrine of liberty. I'm not interested in making you a disciple of Jesus. You're becoming my disciple. Very careful. Doctrine of bondage. Then, let's go on. Second verse, let's turn to Mark chapter 8. You know, the word of God, you remember, this thing about being very careful of the doctrine of Pharisees is that it is mentioned in Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Luke's gospel. Three places it is mentioned. It's mentioned in three places. And three places, something is always hidden. Word of the Lord, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line. Something else is missing. Missing. Matthew, Matthew, Mark chapter 8, verse 13 onwards, verse 12 onwards. Read this. But he deeply sighed in his spirit. Why does this generation seek a sign? As surely I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation then. And he left them and getting into the boat again departed. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Oh, something else here. There is another class of people who will reject the Elijah ministry. First is Pharisee. They were not interested in Elijah ministry. Second is the Herodical class. What is this class? And I want to prove to you that these people reject the doctrine of the Pharisee, the doctrine of Elijah, or the or the message of Elijah. Turn with me to Gospel according to Mark, chapter six, verse fifteen to twenty-eight. When Herod heard, okay, others said, 
This is talking about John the Baptist. It is Elijah. Who is Elijah? John the Baptist is Elijah. Another said, it is a prophet. I like one of the prophets. But the Herod heard. He heard. And he said, this John, whom I beheaded, he has been risen from the dead. He's talking about Elijah. And then what happens? For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For he had married her because John said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now what are these people who reject and kill Elijah finally? The leaven of the of, of Herod, the doctrine of Herod. You know what the doctrine of Herod is? It's a doctrine of compromise. It is a set of compromising believers ultimately who will reject and kill Elijah. Because they don't want to hear about sin. They only want to hear about peace, peace, prosperity, prosperity. When, God, when John comes and says, man, you are, you, are, you are sleeping with your brother's wife, that is wrong. How dare this man says this to me? And he is looking for opportunity to kill Elijah. People who have compromised their convictions. Who are not here nor there. Who think when they come to the temple of the Lord, they have taken the grace of God as a license to sin. I'll show you. Now let me just go to one Old Testament passage. Jeremiah chapter 7 if you will please. Verse 1 onwards. Okay, I'm going to read this. We were looking at this very closely in our Jeremiah Bible study, in our, in our Jeremiah Bible study. So look at this. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, look at this. Who came? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Very careful. In the very first verse, there's a lot of things. Be very careful. So to, to, after I speak, go to the scriptures and say, this guy is really telling the truth or is he leading into bondage, leading us into bondage. Become a good burial. Okay. The word of the Lord from the word of Jeremiah that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the word and say. I'll tell you what happens here. If I'll just give you a background of, of what has happened here. Jeremiah is a prophet during Josiah. Josiah's period. Josiah, if you know, was a very godly man. What happened to Josiah? I'm showing you. You be very, very careful. Just listen to me very carefully and just pay attention to what I'm going to say. Turn with me to Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 34. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 22. Josiah was this man who had this desire in his heart to cleanse the temple of the Lord. He had this desire, God, because they went into back, they backslid as well, backslid, and the temple was messed up. And Josiah was a man right from his childhood who was tender hearted and he wanted to please the Lord. So he said, he said to the scribes and all the people who are in charge of the temple, go and clean the temple. So when they cleansed the temple, one man, he found the book of the law. He takes the book of the law and he runs to Josiah and he says, you know what Josiah, I found this book of the law. And Josiah reads the book of the law and he says, man, we have sinned against the Lord. And he starts repenting in sackcloth and ashes. And then he sends this word to the prophetess. Chapter 34, verse 22 onwards. So, Hilkiah and those king, uh, appointed went to who? Hulda, the prophetess. So whenever the prophetess is mentioned, scripture also writes something very short. The wife of someone. Every time a false prophet is mentioned, no wife. I don't want to get into controversies here. The wife of Shalom. See, you know what? That's the reason why, you know, uh, husband, she says, husbands love your wives. Because it's probably very difficult for a husband to love his wife. It's not that difficult for a wife to love her husband. She loves the husband so much that she wants to take all the decisions for him. So, scripture says, wives, submit to your husband. That's my personal testimony. I'm not creating any doctrine, <laughs> doctrine here. <laughs> so, Hulda the prophetess. I don't want to receive any phone calls tomorrow. The wife of Shalom. The son of Tokta, the son of Jarash, keeper of the wardrobe, she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter and they spoke to her to that effect. And she answered them, thus says the Lord of Israel, tell the man who sent 
you to me. Thus says the Lord, behold I will bring calamity on this place and on this inhabitants. Look at this. What do you expect? Josiah represents Israel, right? Now Josiah has taken the book of the law and he starts reading it and he is repenting. Okay? He is repenting. So you would assume that all the people have also repented. Right? I mean, because after all, Josiah represents, represents Israel and he is a man in the new covenant. But God is the same yesterday, today, forever. He is always interested in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with his people, even when, even in the old covenant. Okay? So, he, what, what does Huldah say? Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on this inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. And then, okay, next. But as for the king of Judah who sent you, to inquire of the Lord. In this manner will you speak. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender. Not the people's heart. Your heart was tender. And you humbled yourself. People did not humble themselves. You humbled yourself. And when you heard his words against the place. And against the inhabitants. And you humbled yourself before me. And you tore your clothes. Not the people. People haven't to torn the clothes. They haven't repented. But this man is repenting. I'm telling you. Don't ever think that Josiah's repentance will translate into the people. Never. Never. Don't ever think if a man behind his pulpit has been preaching and preaching with a compromise. It will translate to the people. It's not going to happen. People have to take a stand. They have to rent their clothes. They have to repent. So let's go, go back to our portion, Jeremiah chapter 7. This is the background. And when Josiah looks, he, he looks at this and he repents and he conducts a, a tremendous Passover festival. Never was that kind of a pass, Passover ever happened in Israel. And you will see all the people, they are coming and worshipping and they are enjoying the Passover. They are remembering the days when they came out of Egypt. All those things they were remembering. And now going to Grace Tabernacle has become a fashion. Let me prove to you. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 of Jeremiah. This one. What's? Okay. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. Now all these people, they have, this is a tremendous momentum that has taken place during the time of Josiah. It seems that all the people have repented and everybody is rushing to the house of the Lord. Okay. Stop. Hear the word of the Lord, all of you Judah, who enter in these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel. <laughs> Josiah amended his ways, but you sir, haven't amended your ways and your doings. If you amend your ways, I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words. The temple of the Lord on Sunday, the temple of the Lord on Wednesday, the temple of the Lord on Friday, the temple of the Lord back on Sunday again. Don't trust in these lying words. This is all religious activity. These are lying words. The temple, okay, are these then? For if you thoroughly amend your ways, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt. This is talking about all the outside, outside things. You have to judge the fatherless, you have to give alms, you have to not shed innocent blood, and you should not worship idols. Outward. Okay, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, again the second time, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. What are the lying words? Will you steal? Will you murder? Commit adultery? Swear falsely? Burn incense to Baal in your secret and walk after other gods to your own hurt. And then come to the and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do, to do these abominations. What are you thinking? That the grace of God, the spirit of Elijah, which has come and asked you to repent, and now you think that you're coming to Grace Tabernacle, there is religious activity, you're coming every week, diligently, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, that will save you? You have not dealt with stealing. 
Do you think believers don't steal? You have taken money from somebody and you have conveniently forgotten God calls you a thief. Psalms 37. 21. The wicked borrows and does not return. Look at this. You can read it and you will say, boss, you are putting a condemnation on us. No, this is the word of God. The wicked has borrowed and he has conveniently forgotten. You are a stealer. You are a thief. Will you murder? Hmm. Slander, our church is known for that. Sorry, it's not an indictment. Judge yourself. That is murder, equivalent to murder. That you hate your brother without a cause is murder. And you commit adultery. How many of us men are not guilty of lusting with our eyes? I, you know, one thing that I love, one last Old Testament passage, and that's that, 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 that I'm done. Ezekiel chapter 24, please. 15. Onwards. Verse 15 onwards. I love this. Because it convicts me to the core. Also the word of the Lord came to me and saying, Son of man, behold, I take from you the desire of your eyes. He's talking about his wife. This is God's testimony about Ezekiel and his relationship with his wife. Ezekiel, I know that you love your wife. Love your wife. And you don't even want to think about adultery. You don't even want that thought to ever come into your mind. Job said, I have, ne- I have made a commitment with my eyes that I will not look after another maiden. Ask ourselves, brothers, how much we are guilty of this. We have to go and apologize to our wives if you have done that. You have committed adultery because God says that if you have lusted after a woman with your eyes, you have already committed adultery in your heart with her. And then we come to the house of the Lord. And you say, we are delivered to do these abominations. You have taken the grace of God to lasciviousness. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. Back to the New New Testament now. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. Certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago are marked out for condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, into a license for sin. They think they come to the words of the Lord because they worshipped, they put an offering and they have not amended the ways God says. You are a compromiser. You have got the doctrine of Herod. And one fine day when the time comes, you may be coming and sitting very comfortable in this church now. But when the testing comes, you will kill Elijah. You are just looking for an opportunity to take Elijah's life. Judge yourself today. If you have that spirit. Compromisers. Why do I have to say this to this church? <laughs> you are doing well. Let me prove to you why I am saying this. Turn with me into Acts chapter 30, 20. Man, when I read this, does it not scare me? Verse 27 onwards. Now this is the church at Ephesus. Planted by Paul. Okay, let's read it from verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to the shepherd, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, he's warning the elders in the church at Ephesus. The eldership. He's warning them. He's not prophesying. He's not saying that this is what is going to happen to you. No, 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 no. He's just warning. There's a difference between warning and prophesying. He's just warning. Okay? Okay. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves are waiting. Will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up. Speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples to whom, sir? Ah, to themselves. 
Church ourselves today. It's a warning. Do we have the spirit in our church? Do I have the spirit when I... Do I want to make disciples? You do to be my disciples. Will I preach the same passion if only one person comes? I have to judge myself. Judge myself. Continuously. And then... Look, next, verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you with night and day with tears. That is the tough part. And our church. Remember, when Paul started the church at Ephesus, the word of the Lord, he just rented a small place, the word of the Lord from Ephesus went to the entire Asia Minor. It's a very, it's very reminiscent of our church. The word of the Lord is being preached here and it is being, it is going to the ends of this world. Ends of this world. Three years, night and day, with tears. This is what the condition, and you know, Paul is warning the church in Ephesus. But what has happened to them? Has it really come to pass? Turn to Revelation, chapter 2. I know when he writes the, 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 the letter to the epistles, Paul doesn't have any bad things to say about them, per se. Okay, he's not, he's not rebuking them like the, the church of the Corinthians. No, he's not doing that. Ephesians, it's kind of a good church. And you'll see that. This is a testimony. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? Read very carefully. When, even when Jesus is commending, when Jesus is commending them, there is an element of rebuke. I know your works. Your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Fantastic. Till now. You have tested who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. You know what this is? This is evaluation. Evaluating. You call yourself an apostle? Okay, let me see your life. Okay. Husband of one wife. Pay your taxes. Okay, fine. That's a good, that's good, that's good. That's good. That's what Paul said. When anybody desires to be a bishop, he has to be a husband and one, of one wife and several other qualities. Not, not, not greedy or filthy lucre, etc., etc., etc. That's good. But then you looked at his life and you found that evaluating spirit, that spirit of evaluation. <laughs> Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 5. I just want to reinforce this. Let me tell you exactly where to start. Verse 41. Now this is the Pharisees when they have come to Jesus. Okay, Verse 41. I do not receive honor from men. This is God, Jesus talking himself. But I, but I know you. He's talking to the Pharisees. That you do not have the love of God in you. Go on. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. This is, the, this is all we have already studied. You are only interested in the opinions of men. Not God's opinion. Okay. And how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from, the, from only God? Verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is none who accuses you. Moses in whom... There is one that accuses you. Moses in whom you trust. Why? For if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote of me. Now this people, they're coming and evaluating Jesus' life. Who's your father? Oh, you are not even a Levite. Yeah, come on, you're, a, you're from the tribe of Judah. Of Levites, they know the law, I understand. But you're not even a Levite. How come you're preaching with such authority? Evaluating his life. Evaluating. This evaluating spirit is very dangerous. It's good. It's good to test the spirit behind the doctrine. It's good. But don't just get carried away by evaluating people. When you're sitting in the pulpit, don't judge the man who's preaching from the pulpit. Very careful. Very careful. You don't receive anything. Very careful. Go back to church at Ephesus now. Chapter 2, Revelation. Okay? And you have persevered. Okay. Okay, sorry. Go go ahead. Go go before. 
patience and have persevered and have patience and have labored for for my name's sake and have not come and have not become weary man you have a lot of religious activity going on nevertheless i have this against you that you left your first love this is the indictment towards the church of church at ephesus now this is a church that has been planted by the by apostle paul now he warned this. He said, from among you ravenous wolves will get up. And there will be men who will rise up from among you who will draw people to themselves. But how come this church is so good in their activity? You would think that a man who is ravenous as a wolf will fleece the congregation. Would, would fleece or, or, or always lead them astray. He's wicked. He would lead them to himself. But that's not what is happening over here. There's a lot of good works that is going on and Jesus has good words to say about this church. How do you say that they have rejected Elijah? How did the church at Ephesus reject Elijah? How did they reject? Because you have a wolf and you called him a wolf but he is not teaching us bad doctrine. We are having a lot of religious activity but there is no devotion. There's no personal devotion. I'll tell you something. The clue lies in one verse. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 7. This is the final warning. He says, repent. Otherwise I'm going to take the lampstand from you. Repent. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. No, no, no. And I'll, this is verse 7. I'm going to, this, there's a clue in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the spirit says to the churches. And this is to the church at Ephesus. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That is a clue. Remember, let's go back to the garden of Eden. Remember, Jesus, God said, of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat. Of tree of life, you can eat. That's what he said. But when you have a pharisaical spirit and a pharisee who is preaching from the pulpit, he is only interested in knowledge, 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 knowledge. He is not interested to get the knowledge of God and also the life of God. First, get the life of God. You want to get the power of God without the life of Jesus. That will not happen. When the church at Ephesus, the pulpit is leading them away and telling, read the scripture, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge. But there is no obedience in their life, very little obedience. They are not interested in the life of Jesus. They are not interested in a personal devotion with Christ. That's what, that's what a pharisaical spirit will do. Which will lead you astray and finally you will be interested in knowledge. You want to get power without the life of Jesus. Power without humility. Power without bearing your cross. Power without repentance. Look at, look at the danger that we are in. We have to judge ourselves today. In the light of what we have heard. You can easily reject the spirit of Elijah if you have a pharisaical spirit. And a pharisaical spirit is very, very subtle. You don't even recognize what's happening. You're not taking part of the life of Jesus. You're more interested in the letter of the law, not in the spirit behind the law, behind the letter. Read the scriptures. How much of obedience? You've come to Bible study. How much of obedience? How much of devotion to Jesus and his church? This is something which we have to look at. So when we come to this church, Come to this church. This church, I believe, is a warning. I'm telling you something. This was one part that came to my mind. And it wouldn't just now go. Have I rejected the spirit of Elijah? The doctrine of Elijah? The call to repentance? Every time I hear the word, the natural sequence of events is, first, I might get a little offended, but then I go back home and judge myself. I go to my knees and repent. You repent. You repent. Is there more and more of repentance in your life? I'm telling you, a true man of God and a true disciple is this. He first starts off and says, I'm the least of the apostles. At the end of the life, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. That meant so much of repentance in his life. 
The word of God has become life. Ask ourselves. I'm going to stop here. One thing that I beg of this church. It's very easy to judge. Very difficult to live. Don't think that when people come on this pulpit, those, those people don't have any, what do you call, weaknesses. Oh, man, if you see a pastor's meeting and pastor's counseling his pastors, you know how many weaknesses you have. No man is worthy. But thank God we are not under the curse of the law. We have been redeemed from the curse. The letter will always kill, but the spirit will bring liberation. Let's, let's not get carried away by this, this attitude of judgmental spirit, because one day you will totally foc- lose focus of the Elijah ministry. And you'll have a doctrine of Pharisee like the church at Ephesus. Finally, what happened? Did they repent when Jesus came and warned them? No. Went into obscurity. Went into obscurity. It's not even mentioned anymore. God had to raise another set of people who will live the life of Christ. Who will be more interested in making disciples of Jesus than disciples to themselves. Let's judge ourselves today. Let's shall we pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for this word that was spoken, was shared. Father, I don't know, Lord. I can't speak on behalf of anyone over here, I can speak to, on behalf of myself. I want to repent, Lord. I want to change. I don't want to miss that Elijah ministry. F- Father, when the first time when Jesus came, the Pharisees were, because of the doctrine of Pharisees, they rejected the Messiah. But when the Messiah comes the second time, Lord, you're coming in judgment. You're not coming in mer- with mercy and grace. We don't want to miss that a lot, Father. We don't want to miss that. As a church, we don't want to miss that. We want to humble ourselves continuously, O Lord. Continuously, O Lord. We want to repent every time the word is preached, O Lord. It will be a natural thing in our church, a natural occurrence, that we will hit our knees and repent before you, O Lord. And walk in obedience. Quicken each one of our spirits, O Lord. Strengthen our inner man, O Lord, Father, so that we will walk in obedience to your word, O Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise you, we worship you. Give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.